Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner. We're at NAFB Trade Talk in Kansas City. With us is protein analyst with Bravo AgriFinance, Don Close. Good afternoon, good morning, I guess. Good morning. So today we're going to talk a little bit about global protein and kind of a, let's start first with a big picture and talking about the global protein outlook as we look mm -hmm. ahead to 2020. Well, the, the, the disruption that we've had in the marketplace in 2019, led by China, but the spread of African swine fever throughout Southeast Asia, now into Indonesia, um, it's not over. And, and those are going to, that's going to continue to be the central focal point of the market in 2020. Uh, the, the thing that we will see is different is if you take a lot of the countries that have been particularly supplying pork to China, they're now so oversubscribed that that chase for those remaining available pounds is going to become more intense. So we're still looking for a lot of price action, price volatility in 2020. So really, the big story for us continues to be this African swine fever yeah. outbreak and the spread, because it's not just in in China anymore. We've seen it in several yeah. different countries, Absolutely. and it's not necessarily, maybe it's slowed down, but it's not stopping. So as we take a look at that, how does that not only impact the swine market, but those other proteins as well? You know, that's really been an interesting development. When, when AFS first broke in August a year ago, our initial view was that, that broilers would be the grand prize winner just because of the life cycle and the, and the lower price. We thought that pork would be a big winner and just on filling the void of production and, and felt that beef would probably be a winner but third place. What we've seen develop throughout this year is that beef has been way more competitive and a price winner than what our initial expectations were. Part of, a large part of that is because of the drought considerations in Australia. Uh, a lot of it is due with the escalating sales that uh, of, of manufacturing beef from New Zealand and Australia to China that has shortened up the quantity of product coming to the United States. So beef has been much more competitive or much more winner in this whole shortfall than what our initial expectations were. Let's talk a little bit about how that's played back uh, for U.S. beef producers. Okay. I know we saw a setback in prices after the Tyson fire and cash prices dropped significantly. Uh, they really have made a steady climb in recent weeks and, and have pushed back through those levels. How does that set us up then for the rest of this year? And going into 2020. The the recovery rally in, in cattle prices has been nothing short of phenomenal. <laughs> uh, and to see a, a, a 20, $22 rally in, in front end futures with no correction whatsoever. Uh, we kind of we kind of started on that correction yesterday, but but still an incredible rally. The real one of the real drivers in that, number one, beef demand both domestic and globally continues to be incredibly good. Beyond that, we, we have seen for the year, we've seen like a 30% reduction in the shipments of manufacturing beef from New Zealand. Uh, our shipments of, of manufacturing product from Australia has actually been up about 6% for the year. But as more and more of that product is displaced and going to China, Asia, there'll be less of it coming to the States. So it's in the price spread between Australia, New Zealand trimmings delivered to U.S. ports opposed to U.S. domestic 90s, that price spread's been about $35 a hundred. That's crazy. Um, and it's, it's, so it's, it's demand from the QSR burger sector that is forcing those patty manufacturers to go over and buy whole muscle cuts of U.S. fed beef that in, that that's been price supportive to cutout values. So while it's a complicated chain of events, it's all driven by that global shift in trade flows. 
We know that China is a big factor regardless, whether we're talking about pork, whether we're talking about poultry now at this point, yes. and, and now beef. So yes. let's talk a little bit about uh, the trade situation, not necessarily just with China, but some China. of those other markets. We've China. had uh, the Japan trade deal yes. signed. Yes. Now we're waiting for implementation. Yes. That's got to be a, a, a big boost potentially for U.S. beef producers. You know, I was at the uh, USMEF planning session last week, and, and those agreements obviously were center stage of a lot of discussions. And, and the outcome from those conversations were that the, the real impact will be the U.S.-Japan agreement and that we're on equal uh, tariff footing with the Australia and New Zealand. <clears throat> That's going to be a big driver for U.S. beef going forward. We're still seeing growth with the shares of U.S. beef with South Korea. That's become, you know, and the U.S. is, is the biggest share of that market. So those are going to continue to be the big driver. With China and U.S. beef, I think the real the thing you need to keep in mind is one is the shortfall of protein into China today is greater than the world can provide. There's going to be a shortfall of product. But then on the on the beef side, particularly U.S. beef side, their beef consumption per capita has historically been so low. The first goal is to build that palate for beef. Once that's done, then start teaching them and showing them the, the high quality product. So U.S. and China trade, yeah, it's good. We're going to send a lot of pork. But the beef trade, we're really talking long ball before we see big influences from China. Where does USMCA play into this whole thing? We're still waiting to get that trade deal uh, through, passed through the finish line on all three, through yes. all three countries. Is that potentially a big mover for us? Uh, not necessarily maybe 2020, but in that mid to long term uh, range. It, it's you. You know, simply put, we've got two of our three largest trading partners up in the air. So yes, it's a it's a huge deal. If you look at changes in that agreement on protein, there's really no significant changes from what was in the US trade agreement. So it shouldn't be a big influence short term, but in the event we don't get that agreement passed and those relationships start to break down, it, it's it's a big headache coming if we don't get it resolved. Is it more worrisome for the pork side of things than it is the beef side of things? I think about the ham situation on pork specifically and, and getting um, like that market specifically. I would have to agree, agree with it and be really quick to agree with that. Just 40-some 40, 40 percent of our U.S. ham exports are going to Mexico. So yes, it's a, it's a huge number. On the beef side, it's a very important trade, but on a tonnage basis, it's almost it's almost a trade-off mm -hmm. that we're sending high-quality product down there for their HRI trade. They're sending a lower-quality product and more of a manufacturing product to the state. So, on a dollar value basis, the U.S. wins. But on tonnage with Mexico, uh, it's it's pretty close to a draw. Our relationship with Canada, certainly for this year, we've been a much larger importer of Canadian product than we have been an exporter of Canadian product, but uh, it's still a very, very important trade relationship. Great conversation about where things are going, big picture. Let's talk and wrap things up with a okay. price outlook for right. both beef and pork as okay. we look ahead to 2020. Okay. The, the initial outlook has been that uh, prices for the coming year would be very, very similar to where we've been the last two years. Uh, the, the first initial pri annual price forecast that I put out for 2020, I'm, I'm looking for spring highs and fed cattle in that dollar thirty level, high 120s, 130 level. Uh, see the market peak and as we get to next summer, uh, still look for an August low in that dollar, dollar five level. So again, just almost a repeat from what we've seen the last two years. As, as this whole trimmings market has unfolded in the last month, month and a half that we talked about earlier, uh, the drive that has put in cutout 
We're spending way more time thinking we could see higher prices this spring than what that initial price forecast suggested. I haven't officially changed that forecast yet, but, but I'm certainly looking at it. Do producers, one final follow-up question, do producers need to think maybe about protecting uh, and, and, and maybe mitigating some of their risk when we look at uh, what's been a pretty tough crop year and protecting their input side of things to keep that, to, to benefit that bottom line? I, I could not agree with you more. Um, the equity drain that we have had throughout production agriculture in the last three to four years the, the volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace, both, both from natural influences of the weather, but also the artificial influences of all this trade volatility. Um, equity lines with, with so many producers are really being stressed. If there was ever a time because of market volatility and because of the level of exposed risk exposure that producers are facing, I think it's absolutely time to have a risk management plan in place. Don, it's been a pleasure. Nice to see you again. Always good talking with you. Thank you. See you. From Kansas City, Missouri, I'm Megan Grebner for Roundfield.